Tommy loved Mr. Henson. Mr. Henson was the sixth grade science teacher and he was the best science teacher that Tommy had ever had. In fact, he was the best teacher Tommy had ever had. That's what Tommy thought. Mr. Henson knew everything there was to know about science. I mean, if Tommy asked Mr. Henson, how far is the earth from the sun? Mr. Henson knew right off the top of his head about 93 million miles. If Tommy asked Mr. Henson, how far is the moon from the earth? Right off the top of his head, about 240,000 miles. In fact, sometimes Mr. Henson would take his class out for nature walks and he would show them all about the grass and the trees and different insects. And every now and then, in a nature walk or something like that, Mr. Henson would say, class, isn't it amazing how this insect evolved the ability to fly or to protect itself? Every now and then that kind of statement came from Mr. Henson, but Tommy never really put two and two together until today. You see, today things were a little different. Today Mr. Henson said, class, we're going to learn about the origin of the universe. Can anyone tell me how the universe began? Eugene Lepton's hand went up immediately. Now, Eugene Lepton knew everything that a sixth grader could know about science. He took his science book home for fun. He made a 100 on every single science test unless there was a bonus question. And then he made a 100 and fine. Mr. Henson said, yes, Eugene. Eugene said, about 14.8 billion years ago, a tiny ball of matter about the size of a period at the end of a sentence exploded in what is commonly referred to as the Big Bang. And Eugene went into the textbook spiel of the origin of the universe. Mr. Henson said, Eugene, that is outstanding. Then Mr. Henson said, class, can anyone else tell me how life began? Katie raised her hand. Mr. Henson said, yes, Katie. Can you tell us how life began? Katie said, yes, about 4.5 billion years ago, the earth was formed out of space dust, and on the surface of the earth, there was a warm chemical soup. Something like a lightning bolt hit that warm chemical soup and caused those chemicals to evolve into the first life. That first life gradually evolved into a fish. That fish gradually evolved into an amphibian. That amphibian gradually evolved into a lizard. That lizard gradually evolved into, over multiplied millions of years, a lower mammal. That lower mammal evolved into a lemur. That lemur evolved into a monkey, and that monkey evolved into a man. Well, Mr. Henson said, that is outstanding, Katie. Tommy had a problem. You see, that wasn't what Tommy had been taught at his house. Oh no, Tommy had been taught that in six 24-hour days, God had spoken the earth into existence and that there weren't multiplied millions of years for evolution and that humans didn't evolve from monkeys. God created Adam from the dust of the ground and then created Eve from one of Adam's ribs. And Tommy wasn't the only one who had been taught that. In fact, 90% of the class had been taught exactly what Tommy had been taught, and Tommy was having some problems. Mr. Henson was the smartest man he knew, at least about scientific matters. Now, Tommy's dad could, could fix a car, or Tommy's dad could fix a washer or a dryer, but he didn't know science like Mr. Henson. And Tommy wanted to know who was right. Well, in the back of the class, Stephen raised his hand. Mr. Henson said, yes, Stephen. And Stephen, in a very nervous but courageous voice, said, Mr. Henson, evolution's not right. My dad says that God created everything in six days. Well, now Tommy was thinking, yeah, that's, that's what my dad says too, and so was 90% of the class, and they wanted to know what Mr. Henson was going to do with this information, and they were shocked when a smile crept across Mr. Henson's face. And Mr. Henson said, Stephen, where did your dad get that information? And Stephen said, well, from the Bible. And Mr. Henson said, that's what I thought. And he walked over to his desk, and he opened the top left drawer, and he pulled out an old leather book and he came back and he 
started reading that to the class. And in his reading, he started reading words like hast and doeth and createth and maketh. And then he asked the class a question. He said, class, does this sound like an old book to you? And you know, for whatever else it sounded like, it did sound like an old book. And they said, yeah, yes, it, yes, sir, it sounds like an old book. And Mr. Henson said, it is an old book full of old ideas. He said, in fact, the people who wrote this book thought that the earth was flat, and they said it had four corners. And he chuckled a little bit, and he said, this book, it's fine if you want to read about some history. It's fine if you want to read about morality. But for scientific information, it is absolutely no good for anything. Modern science has disproven this book years ago. And with that statement, he put that book back in his drawer, and he left 21 sixth graders wondering if what they had been taught all their lives about the Bible was right. If you have never asked yourself the question, does God exist and can I prove it? Eventually, you will come to the point in your life where you wonder if God really does exist. And if God really does exist, is there evidence that would prove that idea? This course of lessons, this Out With Doubt series, is designed to help us understand and prove the fact that God exists, that the Bible is God's Word, and that Jesus Christ is God's Son, and that things like evolution are false and we can prove that. And we're going to go about that proof by using some scientific laws. And that's what this first lesson is going to be about, the scientific laws proving God's existence. Now, a scientific law is not anything like a, a law that a legislator would make. For instance, suppose that you're driving down a highway and you look to the right and there's a speed limit sign. Now, that speed limit sign tells you how fast you can go. You look to that speed limit sign and it says you can go 55 miles an hour. Now suppose that it's a long straight stretch of road and the legislators think that we should be able to go faster than that. Well, how would they go about changing a speed limit? Well, what they would do is they would all get together and they would vote on that. All those in favor of changing the speed limit to a higher speed limit, 65 instead of 55, say aye. Aye, 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 aye. All those opposed, okay, the ayes have it. We have just changed the law from 55 miles an hour to 65 miles an hour. It's that simple. But a scientific law is totally and completely different from a law like that. You see, a scientific law is not one that legislators could change. It's not one that people could vote on. It's one that is constant, and every time anyone has ever studied it, it always does the same thing. For instance, the law of gravity. The law of gravity says that things fall to the center of the earth at about 9.8 meters per second squared. If I were holding a set of keys and I dropped those keys, which way would they fall? they would fall down. Suppose I dropped those keys 10 times. Which way would they fall? Down every single time. Suppose I dropped those keys 100 times, 1,000 times, a million times. Which way would they fall? Well, they would fall down every single time. Now suppose that we have uh, come into some conflict with one of the scientific laws. We don't necessarily like them. And we wanted to change one of the scientific laws. Well, how would a person go about changing a scientific law? Well, suppose that we said this. We're going to gather a million of the most brilliant scientists in the world, and we're going to get them all in one place. And then we're going to see if they like the law of gravity. So we do that. We gather a million of the most brilliant scientists in the world, and we ask them a question. Do you like the law of gravity? And all of them, to the man or to the woman, they say, well, not really. You know, we've been bugged by the law of gravity. It uh, hasn't really allowed us to do what we have wanted to do in science. And you say, okay, let's change that law. All those in favor of changing the law of gravity say aye. And one million of the most brilliant scientists and yourself 
all vote to change the law of gravity. Have you changed the law of gravity? And then suppose that you say, okay, now that we've all voted one million and one votes to change the law of gravity, I just need a volunteer who will step off of a 20-story building to prove that we've changed the law. <laughs> Are you going to volunteer? I certainly am not. Because you could have a million or a billion or six billion people all vote to change the law of gravity and those votes would avail to nothing because that law would never change. Are there some laws in science that would verify or prove God's existence? Uh, I think there absolutely are, and we can look at those, the first of which is called the law of cause and effect. The law of cause and effect is the most fundamental scientific law that is used in every experiment that is ever done. You, although you might not know it, use that law on a regular basis. Here's what that law says. In this material universe, every material effect that you see has a cause that came before it and that was greater than it. Now, let's put that into practice. Suppose I am standing up here and you are listening so well, you are on the edge of your seat in rapt attention, listening to every word that I say. And suppose I had a songbook sitting beside me that was on a desk. And that songbook launched 95 miles an hour to the back of the room and shattered into a thousand pages. And you looked up at me and you said, Kyle, what caused that to happen? Now hold on just a second. Why did you think anything caused that to happen? Don't songbooks just sometimes spontaneously launch themselves across rooms going 95 miles an hour? Well, absolutely not. There had to be a cause that came before it that was greater than it because it's a material effect. So I say, well, I am glad that you asked me that question. Let me explain it to you. As I was standing up here speaking to you, there was in my ear buzzing a huge, monstrous, the biggest one I have ever seen, almost the size of a dime, a big house fly. And that housefly landed on the edge of that songbook and catapulted that songbook 95 miles an hour to the back of the room and shattered it into a thousand pieces. Do you believe that? Well, it's a cause that came before it, but what's the problem with it? Well, it's not big enough. It's not great enough. It's not bigger than the effect. So you would well understand that a, a fly couldn't catapult a songbook going that fast? Let me give you another example. Suppose you are driving up the interstate and there is beside you a UPS truck. UPS truck is hauling some mail, some packages, and all of a sudden that UPS truck stops screeching to a halt, does three flips, and lands in the ditch. Well, you quickly get out of your car, you dial 911, you go to help the UPS truck driver, and you get him out of that driver's seat and you say, Sir, are you okay? And he says, Yes, but you've got to clear everybody off of the road. And you say, Why? He says, Well, they're, they're everywhere out there. They're all over the place. There's no way to avoid them. And you say, There's no way to avoid what? And he said, I saw it about 50 yards in front of me. The meanest most dastardly, nefarious, most vicious looking mosquito I have ever seen and that mosquito planted into the front of my truck and caused my truck to do three flips and land in the ditch. And you pick up your cell phone and you say 911, I think we need to get an ambulance out here a little quicker than I thought. We have some serious head trauma. <laughs> well, why would you not believe that? because a huge multi-ton UPS truck would never come to a screeching halt because of a little bitty mosquito. Well, it's a cause that came before it, but it's not a cause that's big enough, that's great enough for the effect. Now, how does that apply to the existence of God? Well, the standard textbook evolutionary definition is this. 
about 14.8 billion years ago, a tiny ball of matter about the size of a period at the end of a sentence exploded in the Big Bang. Now, we need to analyze that idea from, from two angles. Number one, where did that tiny ball of matter come from? Do you know when you ask the evolutionist, they will stutter and stammer, and some of them will suggest, well, well we don't know, uh, that's really not our thing to discuss, we just need to talk about once it got here. And the other ones will say, well, it came from, from nothing. Oh, okay, it came from nothing. And then when you ask them, well, you know, what do you mean by nothing? They say, oh, well, nothing's actually full of all kinds of energy and all kinds of, of movement. And in fact, one scientist suggested that nothing weighed 25 pounds. Folks, you can call nothing something, or you can call something that weighs 25 pounds nothing, but ultimately, if there ever was a time when you had nothing, guess what you would have now? A absolutely nothing. But we know we've got something, this universe, could this universe be explained by a tiny ball of matter exploding in something called the Big Bang? Well, I think we're going to look at that and prove that that is not a viable, valid option. Have you ever wondered how big the universe is? If you go out on a very clear night and you're not close to a city and there are not lights that are, that are polluting the atmosphere where you don't get to see the stars. On a very clear night, and you look out, you can see somewhere between 2,000 and 3,000 stars. If you have something like a, a telescope, you can see 10,000, 20,000. If you have something more powerful like maybe a, a Hubble telescope, you can look out and not only see multiplied millions of stars, but you can see millions of galaxies, tens of thousands of them at least, and they estimate that there are 100 billion galaxies. 100 billion galaxies. Well, how big is a galaxy? If I were to ask you, you probably learned this in about the fourth grade, what galaxy we live in, you would explain to me that we live in the Milky Way galaxy. If I were to ask you how many stars do scientists estimate are in the Milky Way galaxy, you might know that there are an estimated 100 billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy. Now, the number 100 billion is considerable. If you wanted to, to count 10,000 stars a day, and you were trying to count 100 billion, it would take you 27,000 years to count 100 billion, and that's the number of stars in our one galaxy. There are an estimated 100 billion galaxies. Well, you say, I'd like to just travel across our one galaxy. Okay, that's good. Let's suppose that we have a ship that can go the speed of light, and let's suppose that we soup this ship up, and it's going the speed of light, and the speed of light is about 187,000 miles per second. That's about seven times around the equator of the Earth every single second. And we start on one end of our galaxy. And we start traveling across our galaxy going 187,000 miles per second. That is about 586 quadrillion miles a year. And we just want to go across our one galaxy out of an estimated 100 billion galaxies. Do you know how long it's going to take us to go from one end of our Milky Way galaxy to the other end of our Milky Way galaxy? Guess. 100 years? 200 years? 1,000 years? 10 thousand years. Now, remember, we're only going across one galaxy, and there are another 900 and nine, there are another 99, so many more galaxies out of an estimated 100 billion, and we only wanted to go across one of them. It's going to take you 100,000 years to get across our one 
galaxy. You say, Phew, I don't have that kind of time. <laughs> no, neither do I. Suppose you wanted to go to one of our nearest neighboring galaxies. Now remember, we're traveling the speed of light, 586 quadrillion miles a year. And we wanted to go to our next neighboring galaxy, one of the closest, the Andromeda galaxy. You know how long that's going to take us? We get in that same ship, it's going to take us 750,000 years. They estimate that if you wanted to travel across our universe from one side of the universe all the way to the other side of the universe, it would take you 20 billion light years. 20 billion years traveling the speed of light. And what are we told is the cause of all of this huge vastness? A tiny ball of matter about the size of a period at the end of a sentence? Friends, I do not think that you believe that that's a plausible explanation because it is absolutely not plausible. That is a ridiculous idea. I would just as soon or sooner believe that a mosquito could bring a UPS truck to a screeching halt and doing flips into a ditch than a tiny ball of matter could create a universe that's 20 billion light years across. Now, what would the creationist suggest was the cause for the universe? Well, of course, the creationist would suggest that God caused the universe. Well, when the creationists suggest that God caused the universe, the skeptic says, well, hold on just a second. If you say that every effect has to have a cause that came before it and that was greater than it, and you've got a God, then that means the law of cause and effect militates against the idea of a God. You know, sometimes you can change the entire meaning of a sentence just by adding one word. Uh, for instance, you go up to someone and you say, a friend, I like you. What does that convey? Well, we all understand exactly what that conveys. A message of encouragement, of, of affection. Now, you go up to that same person, you say, I like you. Not. Did we just change the entire meaning of that sentence? Oh, we certainly did. And all we did was add one three-letter word. Now, I need to ask you a very serious question, and you need to think very hard. Did we say that the law of cause and effect says that for every effect there is a cause that came before it and that was greater than it? Is that what we said? Think hard. That's not what we said. We said that for every material effect in this material universe there's a cause that came before it and that was greater than it. Why do we have to have the word material? Because we're dealing with a scientific law and science can only deal with the things that we can touch, see, taste, hear, or smell. Science can only study material things. The God of the Bible has never been accused of being material. In fact, over in John chapter 4, verse 24, the Bible says God is a spirit and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. If you wanted to say, how big is God's arm? How tall is God? What is the circumference of God's head? Is there a, a scientific experiment that you could do to get that type of information? Absolutely not, because God is not material. Does God meet the criteria for a cause that would legitimately explain the material effect of the universe? Absolutely. He came before the universe. The Bible describes God in the Psalms as a God that was from everlasting to everlasting. He has always been, will always be. The God who is, who was, and who will be. He was before the universe. Is He a big enough cause? Well, in Genesis chapter 17, verses 1 and following, when God describes Himself to Abraham, He describes Himself as the Almighty God. Job, the patriarch, said that nothing that God wants to do can be restrained from His hand. Is God a big enough cause? He sure is. Did God come before this material universe? He certainly did. Does He meet all of the criteria of a first cause that then subsequently caused this material universe? He does. 
And that explanation far surpasses the idea that a tiny ball of matter exploded and caused this vast, huge universe. Now, there is another thing that we need to discuss, and that is the idea of morality. We have studied multiplied cultures, and in every culture that we have ever studied, we have seen those cultures understand a difference between right and wrong. Now, they haven't always agreed on what is right and what is wrong, but they have all agreed that some things are right and some things are very wrong. Morality, we call it. That idea in humans that when they violate their conscience, they feel guilt. Where would guilt or morality originate if humans evolved over multiplied millions of years from a primordial, non-living slime. Where would they get the idea or the capacity to feel something is right or something is wrong? Well, I would suggest to you that there is no way that that type of morality could evolve. When you look at the animals, they don't have that type of morality. Monkeys never sat around and said, today I think we're going to take a vote on what our community thinks is right and what our community thinks is wrong. A lion never felt guilt when it killed a gazelle and drug it back to the pride to eat. Animals don't feel that. Dirt and rocks don't feel that. Where would you get the idea that some things are right and that some things are wrong? Well, there's really only one place. If a moral, non-material God created humans, you would expect that God to put into humans the ability to understand the difference between rightness and wrongness. After World War II, the Nazi commanders and chiefs were tried at the Nuremberg trials. They were tried for crimes against humanity. They were tried for war crimes and they pleaded not guilty. They said we were not guilty of criminal activity and when they asked why weren't you guilty? The people said because in Germany this was legal to kill Jews. It was legal to take six million Jews and burn many of them up in the gas chambers. That was legal and in fact our government said that it was something we should do. But Robert Jackson, who was the prosecutor from the United States, prosecuted these Nazi Germans under the idea that they had violated a higher law. And they were convicted of war crimes and crimes against humanity. Where would a higher law come from? It wasn't a regional law. Not a law that was in Germany. Not a law that was uh, specific to a, a state, specific to one region a higher law. They had violated a law that was higher than any human regional law. Where would such a law come from? There is only one legitimate place that morality could originate. And that is the higher law above human subjectivity, God. The morally perfect being who in the beginning breathed life into humans and set moral boundaries for them to follow. There are two ideas that are put forth as the explanations for the origination of the universe. Evolution that says 14.8 billion years ago a tiny ball of matter exploded and caused all of the things you see in the universe. Or the idea that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. These lessons are going to further prove as this lesson did that the phrase, in the beginning, God, is the only viable, valid option. I look forward to being with you for the remainder of these lessons where we can discover together the evidence that proves that statement.